Welcome, I'm your host, Christina Haskin, and tonight I'm delighted to have back Felicia Drury Clement. She is the author of wonderful books. Uh, her new book is about the subconscious. It's called The Subconscious, Your Port in the Storm. And um, her previous book, which I loved and is where I found her, is The Acid Alkaline Balance Diet. But tonight we're going to talk about the subconscious. I'll tell you a little bit about Felicia. She is um, an author, nutritionist, and alternate alternative health co consultant. She's an adjunct professor at City College of City University of New York and is the author of The Acid Alkaline Balance Diet and The Subconscious, Your Port in the Storm. Thanks for coming back, Felicia. Well, it's good to be back, Christine. Now, your new book, it, um, that's kind of a shift from the other subject. Uh, what made you interested in the subconscious and decide to do a book Well, I'll tell you, I'm, I've always been kind of what I'd call an amateur anthropologist. I love reading about other, the life of other cultures, the tri tribal cultures, the ancient Greeks and so on. And after reading for many years about these cultures, it suddenly hit me that they had one universal belief, and that was that there are two minds. Besides yeah. the rational mind that we're aware of, uh, that sort of directs our daily life, we have a hidden mind. And that hidden mind is much more expansive and contains many more memories and a lot more knowledge than our conscious mind and that it comes to the rescue of our conscious mind when it fails us. And we can, there are certain things we can do to encourage our connection with the subconscious and thereby, of course, improving our lives. Well, my, um, my feeling always, uh, not uh, individually maybe, but the general feeling is people start to fear the subconscious maybe because of Freud's, uh, that maybe there are these dark secrets and not really maybe want to delve into it. And your um, book is calling it a port in the storm. How is the subconscious your friend? It's, I always think of it as kind of a protective parent, a little bit like a, a, a mother hen feels protective toward her little chicks. Uh, but for some reason there's a sort of perversity about the subconscious. We can't beg it, subconscious, please give me the answer to this. I can't figure it out myself, or help me out. Or uh, can you arrange that my old aunt will leave me a million dollars? When you ask directly the subconscious to do something you want badly, it just doesn't respond. Uh, but there are other ways of getting to it. And one is sort of a general if you, calmness and contentedness. That, that, for some reason, that opens up the channels with the subconscious. And there, there are various ways, of course, of, of achieving this. I mean, obviously, what happens to you, the events in your daily life affect how you feel. But there are also certain times of the day, certain days of the week, even the seasons, when you're more content than at other times. And those, you, you kind of have to find out. So you're more relaxed and open to the suggestions your subconscious mind. Yeah. That's, that's when you're much more likely to make contact. Is it sort of like hypnosis is um, the available, it's people that are easily hypnotized are available at sort of state, you know, when they're not critical of what's happening to them. Is it similar to that? Well, I suppose it is. Yeah. Uh, all I can say is that extreme emotion, even happiness, I mean, jealousy, anger, anxiety, but on the other hand, happiness and joy, all those extreme emotions somehow restrict the subconscious. You just, you have to think calmness and contented. I know even now, if I suddenly feel really happy and I want to go into the joyful mode, I, I draw back and prevent myself from doing that because I want to keep in touch with my subconscious. It's been very good to me <laughs> so long. Well, if, so in what, if you're more daydreaming-ish and kind of not focused and, and obsessive about things, are you that kind Yeah, of but you know, daydreaming, I've read where that's very good, it's kind of relaxing for the brain. In, in physiological terms it's good, but not in terms of connecting with the subconscious. Being alert is also a great way of, of tapping into the subconscious. And I, I'll give you a little story, example of Scott. Uh, when Scott was a little boy, he was lucky to have the grandfather he had because he said to himself, my grandson will be able to make his way in life better if he is alert, if he makes his senses, his vision and his hearing as acute as he possibly can. So he used to take little Scott on trips and 
on trips, they take long walks. And he would point out things. For instance, he'd say, hey, there's a statue. First tell me about the whole statue, and then he pick out the details. And little Scott uh, soon became alert. And he said, you know, by the time he was a teenager, he was almost constantly alert of whatever was going on around him. And he said when he became visually alert, he also started listening more intently. Uh, and what happened then, he said, was that he began having psychic intuitive experiences. And he gave this one as an example, it's interesting. He was an exchange student in Mexico, sitting at a cafe, sipping coffee, when suddenly uh, it came to him that there was going to be an earthquake. And he, he felt a little tug at his brain, and he, the words tumbled out, there is going to be an earthquake very soon. And pretty soon the sidewalk started undulating, and everything started moving, and there was a, a major earthquake. Wow. Uh, yeah, and he, he's always had that sense of, I don't know what it is, but he could sense something in the air which, would, which gave his subconscious could, which gave him a clue as to what the change in weather would be. Well, it sounds like he wasn't blocking the available information that the subconscious or his intuitive self was... For some reason, it, that becomes be, a habit, being yeah. so alert opened up his subconscious to him. And he said, you know, by the time he was a young man and, and busy with his career, he said the subconscious seemed to evaluate everything that ever happened to him. And he just kind of rides along on the, this wave of subconscious uh, authority and everything, everything good has happened to him. So he trusts it. Is there a way that when you have imaginary fears that the subconscious can tell you whether they're real or not? Or it's like a... Um you know, oh, is it yeah. a warning or is it my neurosis at the moment? Well, this is true. Your, your fear, of course, can be your imagination, yeah. especially if you're in some spot that inspires your fear. For instance, I, I think of my friend Mary. She was alone in her house. It was, the sun was setting. It was getting dark. She was at the kitchen sink scrubbing some vegetables. There was a window behind her which cast a shadow on the wall in front of her. And she looked up and said, oh, this is a face. And she ran and hid in the corner of the front hall. Finally, she got the nerve to go back into the kitchen and continue her scrubbing of vegetables. She looked up and said she realized it wasn't a face at all. It was the branch of a tree that was reflected on the wall. Well, this was obviously uh, a, f a fear inspired by her crazy imagination. But take another example of John. Uh, it was Saturday morning. He woke up. A beautiful day. He was happy. He didn't have to go to work. It was a day of leisure. So he went outside to his, to his front lawn and he saw a neighbor and they were having a congenial conversation. He was happy as could be and suddenly his hand started shaking. His heart was beating faster. He thought, am I having a heart attack? He wasn't. He's in perfect health. But he knew there was something wrong so he hastily said goodbye to the neighbor. He went into his house, went to the front hall and he saw a letter that his wife had put on the table there. He picked it up and read it and it was the bank foreclosing on a property. Wow. This yeah. was this, his fear was certainly a warning from the subconscious. It prepared him for what he was going to find in that letter in his front hall. <laughs> what, um, wow. What, how, when people want to change their life or they're kind of stuck, how can they, um, I know you said they can't ask directly, but how can the subconscious help them find? what they really want to do in life and yeah, well, besides finding, who they want to live with. And yeah, finding uh, finding uh, uh, when you're most calm and content so that you can link up with the subconscious. A change of, of scenery is always a good idea. Uh, and that brings to mind another story. Uh, a girl named Madeline, a friend of my daughter's. She had arrived at the age of 40, had a wonderful job. She was vice president of a bank. She graduated Phi Beta Kappa from an Ivy League college, and she said to herself, I've had such success, I should be happier, and I'm not. And some little something from her subconscious said, well, it's because you haven't been following your true path. You're not doing what you were meant to do. And she kind of answered her subconscious and said, how can I when I don't know what that is? Well, she knew it was up to her to find out. She had a two-week vacation coming up. So when she got home from work that night, she was, she was in her library. She went over to the desk and she gave the globe a twirl, closed her eyes, put her finger on the globe to stop it. 
she opened her eyes and looked, and she put her finger on London. Wow. So she said, it's, it's it. in, in <laughs> London, I'm going to find out my mission in life. So she went to London very eagerly. And every day she'd wake up bright and happy and think, today I'm going to find out my muse. And it didn't happen. Every day, and she was so toward the end of her vacation, in fact, the last day, she was wandering around the London streets looking for a place to have lunch, feeling kind of disconsolate, not very happy. And she saw a sign, homeless shelter. She doesn't know why, but she walked in. There was a line. It was a kind of a cafeteria. She grabbed a plate. She filled her plate and went and sat down on a bench, a table with the homeless. And she suddenly felt at home. She had a feeling she'd never had before. Wow. She started talking, having little conversations with the homeless. And she knew she'd found her mission in life, and that was working for, with the homeless. She went back to Chicago, where she was living, and she found a job managing 15 homeless shelters. She made friends with some of the homeless and also with the people who worked with them. And uh, she's as happy as she can possibly. She really feels fulfilled. And she said it was thanks to her subconscious. She always says, my subconscious self within myself saved me. That's, that's uh, it's real, you know, then I would just imagine that from there on she would trust it and continue to well, use it as she's, a resource. Well, she's had her, she has her ideal life, and the subconscious, I suppose, is probably continuing to advise her, but... but where does the wisdom, the subconscious wisdom that is this treasure trove of so much information, is it from past generations, or how is it so much smarter than our conscious mind? Okay, well... Our conscious minds, it? Uh, yeah, it yeah. really is. Our conscious yeah. mind holds the memories of what's happened to us during our lifetime, and that's all. The subconscious, and the most brilliant people have, have talked about the subconscious as a micro universe. It has memories that stretch back generations and generations of culture, of genealogy of our family, uh, uh, DNA, uh, even archaeology, how the, how, the, how the earth evolved to the point where we have seasons, for instance. It has this tremendous compendium of knowledge, and it also has events that happen to our forebears and the decisions they made to solve problems. And that's where, where it gets its, its genius for making the right decision and giving us the right solutions when our conscious mind is at a loss to do so. But why does it hide in that sense? It would be too overwhelming for you to I, know I everything? I almost think it's sort of physiological. Yeah. That, that when you're in the grip of emotion, it constricts the channels by which connect the subconscious to the conscious brain. And so what about making a big decision like who you're going to marry or is that finding the right person that's right for you? And, and um, okay. that's, the rational mind is says this guy or that woman should be this type or that type. And that is very often left. Most people leave it to their rational thoughts, and that's entirely wrong. I'm thinking of Fred Jones. He wanted a wife, so he went to a matchmaker, and he made a list of all the qualities he wanted in a wife. She had to be beautiful. She had to be intelligent. She had to have a wonderful sense of humor. She had to be athletic. I mean, she had to be a paragon. <laughs> and he was thrilled when the matchmaker actually found a woman like that. They married. Two years later, they were divorced. He said it never occurred to him to ask for a wife who would be a good companion. She had all those qualities, but there was no connection.